Hi folks, let's use the dust shoe that we made in last week's Wednesday widget and a compression cutter to machine some rich light on the Tormach. Welcome to another Wednesday widget. We're using the super glue technique again. The tape is not necessary. Lots of folks have used super glue before without the tape, but the tape does two things. It increases the work holding ability of the super glue, but equally, if not more importantly, it makes it so easy to clean up. You're generally not gonna have to soak your parts in solvents or acetone to get that glue off. The other thing it does here is that by holding it with full access to the full size, we could potentially drop the height down of the part to redo it in place if we have a mistake. Before we start machining, what is rich light? Rich light is paper, or more specifically, it's layered paper, mostly recycled paper, with a phenolic resin. What's so cool is that while this has an air of a, being a new material, it's been around for over 70 years, and what got me was we actually saw it in an old fixture and tooling jig machining book, and how often do you find a material that's used for everything from kitchen countertops to skate park material to pattern making and dye and fixture work? Pretty cool. When we first read up on it, we were concerned about both machinability and because it's a laminate, the risk of it tearing apart ends up that it machines beautifully. We did a test cut with the Superfly off camera before we started filming and it really has a great surface finish. We wanted to deck it off to get a really nice consistent finish. After that, off to the shear hog. Our standard recipe, 4,000 RPMs, 10 thousandth of an inch feed per tooth. 0.2 inch optimal load and 0.25 inch max roughing step down. I suspect we could run this harder, but we didn't want to risk an operator error or damage in the part since it's a one-off job. The dust shoe does a number of great things. It helps keep a nice image for the video camera so we can see what's going on. It helps keep the machine free and clear of that dust and debris that comes off it. But also something else to consider if you're ever working with rich light is it can catch fire. Uh, we actually had a viewer send in a story, an unfortunate story about, uh, I believe it was a lights out job where the tool started rubbing and it started a fire and it did not end well. So keep that in mind. Sounds like the best safe practices would be to make sure somebody's present when this is being cut. After the shear hog has done its work, we're coming in with another 3D adaptive. This time we're using our standard tool 31, a quarter inch end mill. Rest machining is checked and we've selected the four semicircular areas. I just wanted to rough those out to try to minimize the, the surfacing work that we were asking of the ball end mill that's to come. Some free machine materials or laminates or woods that are really easy cutting, you may not have to do this. There may not be very much tool pressure, but we're so used to cutting metals and aluminum that we really want to get rid of most of that material and let our surfacing tools do just that. You're seeing some, what it looks like tearing on the top edges. We were concerned when we first saw that, it comes right off with just your fingernail and it's not any sort of tearing or pushing of the material. Looks bad on camera, but was nothing to be concerned about. And finally, the compression cutter. I had never seen one of these before this rich light job came our way, and it makes so much sense. Take a look at these graphics, courtesy of Harvey Tool. With a traditional end mill, two things are happening. The end mill is trying to pull the work up out of the work holding or vise, and likewise, the effect of the cutting pressure is also trying to pull the tool out of the spindle or tool holder. And you can see that with this graphic here. The consequence with a laminate type of material is it will delaminate, it will start to tear apart. And that's exactly what compression cutters solve. You're having the bottom portion of the tool cut upward and the remaining portion of the tool cuts downward. It compresses those pressures toward the center, which avoids or solves the delamination issue. For a compression cutter to work, you have to have sufficient axial depth of cut to cover that range of where the tool hybrids have blended together. Coincidentally, this job came up right when we were up in Boston meeting with the folks from Harvey and Helical. They happened to make this tool, so we were able to talk to their tech support folks about that tool, and we appreciate it. They were actually kind enough to let us use this one for the video.
Next up, using a quarter inch mill drill to put a chamfer around the outside profile of the part. It's actually the chamfers which is what started the conversation with the customer here. They weren't able to get chamfers working correctly for the three dimensional geometry along each end of this hemispherical cutout. So let's talk a little bit about how we did that. Before we do the chamfers, we're doing some surfacing to surface those out. When we first posted the code, we'd accidentally pulled in the incorrect tool library tool and it resulted, as you can see, in really, really fast feed rates without the RPMs to match it. So luckily this is a pretty forgiving material, tool wasn't damaged. So we reposted with the correct feed rate. We've broken this down into three different cam operations. We've got a scallop, which is a really good go-to for a lot of your surfacing operations. And we've got it doing the majority of the work. But scallop doesn't do so hot in really shallow areas. So we've got a parallel to help surface out the very floor, which actually is flat for that part. And then we did another scallop to handle the chamfer at the very top. Having these stored as templates can be really helpful. Card here to the NYC CNT page where you can download this file, take a look at the cam, and even save these yourself as templates to use in your own files and parts. Same tool, but with a spiral toolpath to handle the inside fillet of the pocket on our part. What's really cool about this is we don't even have to pick any of the geometry. All I've done under the Heights tab is chosen the top height as this edge right here. The bottom height is the bottom floor. We're running a 10 thou step over. In Fusion, because the 3D toolpaths are model aware, they look at your solid model shape. That's all we have to do to get that toolpath. So how do we get this scallop toolpath to work for this three-dimensional chamfer? Not gonna lie, this took a long time to get it right. Let's see if I can recreate it from scratch here. 3D scallop. We'll grab our quarter inch ball end mill. We're going to pick this inside contour as well as the outside contour. And let's just click okay and see what we get. So that's a good scallop. That's what we just came up with, not close at all. First thing I tend to go to these days, geometry, turn off contact only and turn on contact point boundary. Let's see what that gets us. So see how there's some unexpected jagged looks to this? We can solve that under the Passes tab by turning on Smoothing, and we'll say set it at two thousandths of an inch. Okay, getting better. If we compare that to our good toolpath, it's a lot closer. Compare and edit is your friend though. Hold down Control and click the first scallop, so I have both selected. Right click, Compare and Edit. Change the field from All to Different. And that'll let us walk through what is different about these. Some of these are a bit trivial, some of them are really important. Boundary overlap happens to be one that is important. Let's take a look at what happens if we adjust that from 25,000 to zero. Perfect. Now sometimes you'll get a toolpath that will dip really far down and it's a bit odd. And shout out to Rob Lockwood. The trick there is to take whatever value is in your tolerance. This time it's four ten thousandths of an inch. And under geometry, we're going to say additional offset will be negative that amount plus some additional minor amount. Okay. Okay, not quite the same, but pretty close. We still can't get that toolpath to look quite correct. Got some sharp angles that we don't have in our good toolpath. And the secret is an additional smoothing setting. Card here to our video where we walk through what exactly smoothing is. The interesting thing is that there are smoothing settings beyond the one that's in Passes tab, where we just say Smoothing Tolerance. The way we get to those is right click, Compare and Edit, and if we type in Smoothing, you'll see we have this one called Area Smoothing. With that at zero, click OK, Regen our toolpath, and we're now gonna get a smooth toolpath, and one that correctly mimics the toolpath in the video. As I mentioned in the beginning of the video, we left about a quarter of an inch of the extra material at the bottom here. Rather than taking that and decking it off the top, 
I wanted that in case we had a problem with our servicing tool paths or some sort of a mistake, we could probably drop the whole top level plane of our part down and really get a second chance at making the part. Since we didn't have that problem, we're doing a 2D contour now with the ramp feature to walk around that part. We're staying 20 thou off the sidewall, so this won't actually affect the surface finish of the final part, rather just get rid of that extra material. Flipping the part over, and we're still going to use the super glue technique. We don't have nearly as much surface area to hold on to, but still should be fine for the task at hand. Using a couple of dowel pins and a parallel on a Saunders fixture plate to help keep our part square, which is really important because we're also going to be walking around the outside profile of the part with a chamfer. This is an example of where we're not making use of the compression nature of the compression cutter, but we honestly just wanted to see does it work if we're just using the sort of bottom quarter inch of the tool. Worked great. Probably wouldn't recommend it normally because these are uh, relatively expensive specialized cutters and uh, going forward a regular carbide and mill would have done just fine. And finally walking around putting that chamfer on the part. Chamfers are a great way to see how your accuracy and quality of your part turned out because the human eye can usually see about five thousandths of an inch difference in chamfer variation pretty easily. Folks, hope you learned something, hope you enjoy. For us, a ton of great takeaways. Process reliability, giving ourselves a chance to make that part a second time if we had to. Really nailing down our super glue technique, using a new tool, using a dust extraction technique, and a new material. So we certainly enjoyed it, hope you guys did too. Take care, see you next Wednesday. <laughs>